Hi everyone, my name is Sumana, and today I'm going to be talking about oxymorphone, better known by its brand name, Opana. Opana is a painkiller typically prescribed for chronic pain. The active component of Opana is a compound called oxymorphone, which is a semi-synthetic opioid analgesic. Opana is considered a Schedule II drug, which means that there is a medical purpose served by the drug, but it does have a high abuse potential, which I'll be describing in a little bit. If you look at the chemical structure of oxymorphone on the top right of this slide, you may recall that this structure is really similar to that of morphine, which is derived from thebane. Thebane's structure is now shown on the bottom right. As you may remember, thebane is one of the opiates that is found in the opium poppy, and it's a precursor for all of the typical opiate drugs we hear about, like Percocet, Oxycodone, and Hydrocodone. Oxymorphone is a synthetic derivative of thebane. I'll describe how these structural properties play into the pharmacology of oxymorphone in a little bit, but first let's talk about the history of opiana. Oxymorphone was first synthesized in Germany in 1914, but it took many years before the drug was patented. In 1955, Endo Pharmaceuticals patented opiana for its use as an analgesic. Four years later, the drug was approved by the FDA as a Schedule II drug and it entered the U.S. market in three forms, an injectable version, an immediate release tablet, and a rectal medicine. A few years later, the immediate release tablet form was temporarily withdrawn from the market, likely due to high abuse. However, the injectable and rectal forms still remained on the market, though they were used less frequently. More recently, in 2006, Endo Pharmaceuticals introduced Opiana ER, which is an extended release form of oxymorphone. This is intended to treat chronic pain and have a lower abuse potential. However, the drug company found that addicts were still able to find ways to abuse the drug by crushing and snorting it. In response to this, in 2012, Endo changed the formula of Opana ER and added a crush-resistant coating to prevent people from snorting the drug. However, this measure was not as effective as a drug company had hoped. Even though Endo Pharmaceuticals took steps to prevent further abuse of Opana, their move wasn't very effective. A recent episode of an NPR podcast called Embedded described how addicts were able to get around the protective coating of the drug so that they could just inject it. In this clip from the podcast, the interviewer is in a house in Indiana where two addicts, Jeff and Joy, are describing their experiences with Opana and how they got addicted. Here, they show the interviewer how they cooked the drug. I asked Jeff and Joy how they inject a drug that's supposed to have a coating that makes this pill resistant to abuse. Later, Jeff motions for me to come into a bedroom. Okay. Let's see how it's cooked. Yeah, sure. On the dresser, Joy shows me this round, jagged piece of aluminum. It's the bottom of a Coke can. Okay. Here's our infamous can, which has uh, okay. been used to death. Joy puts a tiny white triangle on the piece of aluminum. It's just a piece of a pill of Opana. And this little piece right here. Is that really a quarter? No, that's an eighth. Sorry. That's just a little piece of nothing. Yep. <laughs> and then Joy takes a pair of fingernail clippers and clamps them onto the aluminum. And then she takes a lighter and starts heating up the pill from below. Right away, I can start to see this hard white coating just kind of floating off the piece of the pill. It looks like plastic. A lot of people... Like rubber. That's what this like. is the coating that the drug company put on the pill to keep people from crushing it up and snorting it. So, as you heard, Endo's attempt to prevent abuse didn't really work. People can get around these abuse deterrents with really minimal effort. In fact, you can just Google it and you'll find plenty of videos showing you exactly how you can quickly remove Opana's protective coating in a matter of minutes. So not only did Endo's move lead to an increase in illegal drug abuse, but it also had some really dangerous consequences for public health, which I'll go into right now. Recently, there have been several news reports describing an HIV outbreak in rural communities across the U.S. From early 2015, over 190 people in Scott County, Indiana, have tested positive for HIV. For context, from 2004 to 2013, a span of nine years, only five people had been diagnosed with HIV in that area. 
When the Indiana State Department of Health investigated the cause of this new outbreak, they found that many of those newly infected individuals had been injecting the extended release form of Opiana and had contracted HIV by sharing needles. Basically, Endo Pharmaceuticals' attempt to curb Opiana abuse didn't work. Not only did people start injecting the drug, but they also put themselves at risk for contracting HIV. This is actually the reason why I chose to talk about this drug for my presentation. A lot of us are probably interested in careers in public health or medicine, and this drug has had a hugely detrimental impact to our country's public health recently. But why do people start taking Opiana in the first place? So oxymorphone is primarily prescribed for acute or chronic pain in either an immediate release or extended release form. A 2007 study demonstrated that in patients with lower back pain who are on other forms of opioid analgesics like morphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, or methadone, after switching to Opana ER, these patients demonstrated effective analgesia throughout the double-blind, placebo-controlled treatment period. As seen in the graph on the left, patients' pain ratings did not waver greatly while they were on Opana. However, they were much higher for the patients receiving the placebo treatment. Patients also reported more favorable ratings of Opana than their previous opioid medication, as seen in the graph on the right. Some other favorable effects of oxymorphone included sedative effects and anxiolytic effects. The drug is sometimes administered before surgery to sedate and relieve anxiety in patients. It can also produce feelings of euphoria and relaxation. The negative effects of this drug are similar to that of other opiate drugs we have seen in the course, for example, constipation, respiratory issues, and vision problems. Acute overdose of oxymorphone can cause some really dangerous effects, including respiratory depression, comas, dangerous reductions in blood pressure, and even death. These properties boil down to the pharmacology of this drug, which I'll describe now. As I said earlier, oxymorphone is a semi-synthetic compound derived from thebane. While thebane does not bind to opiate receptors, oxymorphone can. Oxymorphone is a potent mu opioid receptor agonist, and the majority of its properties arrive from this binding. However, at high concentrations, oxymorphone can also bind to delta opioid receptors. It's believed that this binding to delta opioid receptors actually potentiates the mu-mediated analgesic effects of the drug. Oxymorphone has a much more rapid onset of action and a much higher analgesic potency than morphine. It's also about twice as powerful as OxyContin when taken orally. As shown in the table on the left, oxymorphone can be an equianalgesic, meaning that it produces the same analgesic effects as morphine at a third of the dose. As you all probably remember from earlier in the course, mu opioid receptors are found in numerous sites around the nervous system. The figure on the left shows different sites where opioid analgesics may bind. It's thought that the analgesic, euphoric, and sedative effects of oxymorphone arise because of its binding to mu opioid receptors in the thalamus, amygdala, and other cortical areas. Its role in respiratory suppression arises because of receptors in the medulla and its binding in peripheral sites like the GI tract lead to its other symptoms like constipation. Oxymorphone undergoes metabolism in the liver, and its extended release form reaches its peak potential about an hour after consumption, as shown in the graph on the right. The drug and its metabolites all reflect dose proportionality, which basically means that its pharmacological effects increase linearly as a result of increases in dose which is a useful marker for physicians to be confident in prescribing higher doses as needed for patients in pain. Overall, I hope you all learned something new today about Opana and the current public health crisis it's causing across the U.S. Here are the references I used for my presentation. Thanks for listening.